I'd now like to introduce a uh, final presenter of the day, and that will be Steve Williams of uh, NOV. Um, Steve is a chartered uh, engineer with uh, 13 years' experience in uh, oil and gas processing. Uh, he worked at BP uh, Grangemouth uh, in a separation plant, uh, heavily involved in plant troubleshooting, operation and optimisation activities. After graduating from uh, Heriot Watt in uh, 2004, he worked for Acker uh, Process Systems uh, and the design of separator scrubber systems and has worked on a number of uh, North Sea projects. In 2010, Stephen joined uh, Clark Maxwell, a consultancy company, as a senior process engineer and worked on various uh, concept and feasibility studies. He then spent five years at Maxoil, again in the process uh, side, specialising in uh, troubleshooting and operations, assurance assessments, commissioning, start-up and operation at tiebacks, before joining NOV uh, in early 2016 as a process engineering manager. In his current role, Steve is a process responsible for top size design of the NOV FPSO system that you hear about uh, just shortly. And he's been integral in the development of uh, NOV's Honeybee industrialised FPSO design solution. Um, yeah, so I'd really like to uh, invite uh, Steve up to the stage and give his presentation on the, uh, the Honeybee. Thanks, Steve. Hi there, um, my name is Stephen Williams and I'm the Process Engineer and Manager with NOV Float and Production Solutions and today I'll present to you uh, the NOV FPS, standalone FPSO solution um, known as the Honeybee and we've looked at it for the use of developing the UK CS clusters. So an overview of today, I'll give you an introduction um, into NOV FPS and into the, FP, the Honeybee FPSO concept and our product portfolio. I'll also provide you an overview of our Honeybee TM650 FPSO, which has been developed to basic design for use in the UK CS and NCS. And I'll also propose a way forward in using our Honeybee FPSO for developing um, the UK CS clusters based on some design premise data that was provided to us by the OGTC. So just to give you an overview of NOV FPS, um, our intention is to design, build and sell brand new FPSOs for use across the world. Our top sides team were based here in Aberdeen um, with our Hull team based over in Asker in Norway. NOV FPS take responsibility for the design of the FPSO from concept right through to detailed design. And NOV, in collaboration with our EPCIC partners, can design and supply all core technologies for the top sides, the mooring and offloading systems, and the ship itself, so allowing NOV to deliver a complete FPSO solution. So NOV provides the new build asset to its financial alliance partner, Agear, who will own the FPSO and charter the asset to the oil company using the lease and operate model and Petrofac can then operate the FPSO. So the NOV uh, Honeybee FPSO concept is to develop an FPSO with a design life of 25 years for use in multiple marginal fields with a typical field life ranging from three to 10 years. So the Honeybee solution will allow these marginal fields which would otherwise go undeveloped to be produced. So the FPSO obviously has to be designed to handle a, a, a varying um, fluid characteristics, different production profiles and different gas routing options, meaning that this design has to be highly flexible given that no two process systems are identical. And using a generic topside solution um, with core systems and conventional technologies packaged in modules which are all designed using common design philosophies, this gives an ideal starting point for producing a flexible standard and repeatable topside solution for use in multiple field locations. So NOV can also provide um, full field development for field specific solutions and again this is a, a flexible module and repeatable in approach. So in terms of our solutions, NOV has developed a series of industrialised turret moored and spread moored FPSO hull concepts which have all been taken to the basic design level which allows us to create a platform of repeatable solutions. 
mature FPSO design based on standardised hull and mooring elements, plus a clear philosophy for top size layout and integration in pre-feed so that the value of feed can be maximised and project delivery risks minimised. The complete FPSO architecture is conceived and developed by an integrated team, so the thinking has been fully joined up from the start. And NOV has spent significant time and effort with DMV to develop detailed regulatory compliance plans for the FPSO. So the hull sizes, as you can see, um, range from sort of our smallest hull, which is a turret moor 450, um, up to the spread moor 2050, which the number kind of indicates the number of barrel storage. So therefore, the, the 450 can store approximately 450,000 barrels a day. In terms of the, in the UKCS uh, or NCS, we would envisage that the TM450 and the TM650 are the hulls most likely to be used. In using what we have determined as a, an industrialised approach, where NOV as a technology company has developed this platform of solutions, has ownership of all the technologies and ownership and control of fabrication, and as well as control of the supply chain, um, NOV has the competitive advantage and brings by allowing, eliminating potential uh, lengthy pre-feed and feed processes and replacing them with a, a shorter duration gap analysis type feed study. And this gives an advantage of reduced schedule, reduced cost and repeatability. I'll now introduce you to our Honeybee TM650 solution, which is our most mature solution and has been developed to basic design level for use in the UKCS. A suite of engineering documents have been produced through thousands of man hours used, and these include of philosophies, specifications, PFDs, and to P&ID level. NOV performed a market study and identified a target market in the UKCS and NCS to produce oil fields in the API 25 to 45 range with a typical field life in the region of three to 10 years. So it's obviously not economical to viable to use a field specific FPSO to produce fields with such a short lifespan. So this is where the honeybee FPSO with its industrialized concept comes in. The FPSO with its design life of 25 years, which is flexible, robust, and modular and standard in, in its approach can be redeployed across multiple locations. As said, the FPSO is compliant for use in the UK, CS and the NCS, meaning it can be used anywhere in the world. The basis of design um, for our TM650, again based on sort of the market research, was to use um, oil production capacity in the region of 60,000 barrels for light oil, which probably reduces down to around about 45,000 for a, a more medium API crude down to about API 25 which is obviously as a function of the separator residence time. It has a top size gas processing capacity of 90 million standard cubic feet a day, which is based on 60 million scuffs of associated gas and 30 million scuffs of gas lift. It has a produced water processing capacity of 57,000 barrels a day and seawater injection capacity of 80,000 barrels a day. The first stage separator has been uh, designed to operate with a flexible inlet operating pressure in the region of 10 to 25 bar G to suit varying reservoir characteristics. All the flow line design pressures are around about the 245 bar G uh, mark, with the exception of our gas reinjection uh, route, which can go up to 345 bar G. Um, it's preferable if we can use the, the 245 bar G um, design pressures because there is a step change in capex when we move to 345, but of course that's dependent on the field itself. So this is the, uh, the overall process flow diagram um, for the, 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 the honeybee top sites. And what we did was we identified what we feel were all the core systems that are included um, and the vast majority of processing systems that, that you'll see um, in the North Sea. And we also identified a number of additional systems that you would also need to include, um, which may be more field specific, such as contaminant removal, like CO2 removal, H2S, mercury, um, sulfate removal unit on a, a seawater injection package, or produce water reinjection. And we've, and we've thought of another uh, number of other systems also. So we need to leave space on the top sides to allow for these additional kit to be added um, if it's required. 
So I'll just give you a quick run through of these, here are the, the core systems, um, the crude separation, the flare, gas compression, gas dehydration, fuel gas, produce water treatment and seawater treatment and injection. Here the fluids can enter uh, the, the, the process through the production manifold or the, the test manifold. The test fluids um, can be heated up to 60 degrees C and then fed back into the production separator, which again has an inlet heater for warming the fluids up to 60 degrees C. It then the crude then passes through a series of um, interstage heaters where it can be heated up to 100 degrees C as necessary and the pressures drop to less than one bar G to, to suit the, the RVP spec. From here, the crude is then pumped through an electrostatic coalescer where it then meets the half percent BS and W spec that we've assumed. And that from there, it then goes through cooling and then to the cargo. The produced water that's separated in the second stage separator and electrostatic coalescer is recycled to the front end of the plant, which aids separation. And the produced water stream from this first stage separator is a single feed to our uh, produced water treatment, which is a, a series of hydrocyclones and CFU system. In terms of the gas, the gas that comes off the second stage separator is co-mingled with um, the vapour recovered from the, the cargo tanks and goes through a two-stage VRU compression system where the pressure is then boosted to that of the operating pressure of the first stage separator. From here we go through two stages of MP compression uh, which takes it up to about 75 bar G where it's then dehydrated in a TEG contactor system. The dehydrated gas can then be used for fuel gas um, or it can then go to our HP compression system where it was boosted up to 190 bar G and is then used for um, either exported or for gas lift. And then we have this additional gas reinjection compression system which can take the gas up to as high as 300 bar if, if necessary. Um, down here we've got our seawater injection system which um, the seawater lift pumps take the seawater through um, some coarse strainers and through the seawater and cooling medium exchangers um, where the warm seawater then passes through another series of coarse strainers, a cartridge filter, and it's deaerated in our deoxygenation tower before it's then boosted to water injection pressure via the booster pumps and through the water injection pumps up to about 200 bar G. So in terms of the layout and how this, um, how this system looks um, on, the, on the top side, um, what we can see is here kind of NOV sort of in collaboration um, with GE can provide um, all the different um, technologies and equipment to, to fit on, onto this top side of the FPSO with red being indicated by the NOV modules and blue by the, the GE modules. And what we've also done is identify some spare module capacity for the additional field specific equipment that may be required. So in terms of looking at the ship from, from forward to aft or, or right to left in this case, um, we have our, the ships divided into four main areas, which is um, the, the living quarters, um, the, utility, the less hazardous utility uh, modules, the main hydrocarbon process modules, and then on the poop deck area we have our, our offloading, flare and, and metering area. Obviously having the living quarters um, upstream here of, of the wind, all the, the hydrocarbon, all the main modules are, are downwind, which obviously gives an increased safety uh, potential. We have a blast wall here segregating the, the living quarters from the utilities module. Um, and then within this uh, utilities module, um, we have our power generation, our seawater injection, um, our chemical injection, and our utilities module. And here we have a, a spare module, which we feel would be used most likely for a, a sulfate removal unit to support the water injection if it was required. Um, then in the process area, um, we have two main crude separation modules, um, indicated by MO1 two gas compression systems. Um, this contains the MP and HP machine and this contains the VRU and the HP compression machine. And then we've got gas dehydration and fuel gas in this module. With the spare module, um, again, used for any potential field specific requirements that, that um, may, be, may be needed. Um, down the center of the ship, we have a, a central pipe rack, which is used for connecting all the pipe work into and out of the, the modules. And then at the aft end of the ship here we have, this is our crude uh, metering uh, system, 
which goes to our stern discharge system for offloading. Um, and this is our flare knockout drums and flare tower. And we also have a, a lay down area um, here as well. So, as I say, OGC had provided us um, with sort of two, the two different design premises, I guess, which, which we've already seen for possible UKCS clusters. And NOV have prov provided a, a high level technical assessment to evaluate the suitability of the Honeybee FPSO. Um, using the, the more mature uh, Honeybee TM650 design as the starting point. So cluster one um, has two design scenarios. Um, the first scenario, um, which is to produce from um, the field, field A and field B, um, and then also a second scenario, um, which is based on producing additional production from um, an, an existing facility. Um, so we have looked at basically producing these all to the to the FPSO um, as a as a single cluster group, and um, the, the production profiles for these two scenarios um, are indicated here. So we've got a peak oil production rate for scenario one of thirty six thousand, and up to forty five thousand for scenario two. Um, the fluid characteristics are very similar, um, with a crude API range of 30 to 35 API, which is within the Honeybee design envelope. The gas production um, is very low based on, on the low GORs, and the produced water is also said to be very low. Based on the reservoir temperatures and pressures, um, we would expect that the arrival conditions top sides are within the, the Honeybee uh, design envelope. So looking at the second cluster, and based on producing um, from five separate fields um, with a peak oil production of 34,000 barrels a day if they're all produced together, um, that's in the production profile for that's indicated um, by the blue line. Um, if we look at the design data for the fields, um, you can see that there's actually an, an HP HT uh, well in here, which may pose some technical and commercial challenges. Therefore, an alternative scenario without the field R is considered. Um, and again, the production profile for this is, is shown to, to drop to the peak oil rate of 26,000 barrels a day. So the crude API for all the fields is very similar, which is obviously advantageous from a, a processing point of view. Um, and the fields Q and T have a, a higher GOR, which would give um, higher overall gas com co uh, production compared with the first scenario. So we're essentially looking at four different design scenarios here for um, producing to the, the Honeybee FPSO. So in terms of the major design impacts um, to the top sites, which really need to be considered, um, it's important to ensure that we have as much key data at sufficient quality level to allow a robust, flexible solution to be developed. The input data, which is the most uh, significant impact, um, is the production profiles, the reservoir characteristics, and the fluid characteristics, and the surplus gas routing options. So the production profiles obviously govern the size and the, of the system and the equipment sizing. And you obviously want to get to a, an optimal um, sized system, because obviously undersizing a system, you're not going to get your, your payback. Um, whereas if you um, oversize a system, um, you're going to end up with an unnecessarily high capex solution. In terms of the reservoir characteristics, um, the flow line design conditions with higher pressure and temperature design requirements at the top sites result in increased capex. And the requirement for pressure support, whether that's water injection or, or gas reinjection, will impact the amount of top sites equipment. And the size of that is obviously a function of the production rates. And additional thoughts may need to be um, considered on the top size design if, if gas lift is required. So with regards to the fluid characteristics, the actual fluid composition um, primarily um, impact affects the gas compression system, size and specification, and the treatment requirements. And the fluid properties can obviously influence the compressor design and selection, uh, while contaminants such as carbon dioxide or H2S or mercury um, may require additional treatment equipment to be installed. And additionally, the, 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 uh, the quality or the quantity of the gas that's evolved in your second stage separator can also affect your VRU compression system sizing. 
and in addition to the quantity of gas that's produced, um, that may also impact your power generation and heating system design. So in particular, if you've got low gas um, production or low grade uh, fuel gas quality, um, it may not be possible to use um, gas turbines for power generation, which is the, the selection on the Honey Bee TM650. And as such, an alternative solution may need to be found. I think the other major impact is the surplus gas routing option. So obviously the produced gas can be used for fuel gas or can be used for lift gas, but where does that additional gas go? Is it either exported, re-injected, or does it go to flare? Um, if it's to be exported, it obviously needs to meet the export pipeline specification, and likewise there will probably be a gas re-injection specification which needs to be met. And depending on the pressure of the export pipeline or the reservoir, um, if the gas is to be re-injected, the pressure to which the gas is to be compressed um, will have an impact on the compression system design in terms of the number of stages and the pressure profile that's required. So where gas re-injection or export is not a viable option, it, the only solution may be to go to flare, which would typically be a last resort option. So in terms of the, the design premise that we looked at, I guess the main gaps that are actually um, in, the, in the data um, were found to be that the fluid composition um, wasn't available and also the surplus gas routing options um, were not designed. So kind of w without the, this key information, um, we can't fully define the actual top size processing system. But the Honeybee TM650 is flexible in its design and we have considered various fluid compositions and all possible surplus gas routing options. However, reducing the gaps in this data will allow a more cost-effective solution to be developed. And looking at the challenges between the clusters, um, when, using, uh, when designing a system for use in multiple fields, um, there's always going to be various technical challenges between the fields. And if we look at the top size challenges associated with producing these uh, UKCS clusters, uh, we, can f we find that there was, a, there was a step change in the oil and gas processing capacity um, required between cluster one and cluster two. Hence, the optimal system size would be different for both those systems. And then based on the reservoir characteristics, the high pressure and temperature reservoirs in cluster two um, would mean that cluster two would potentially um, benefit from having three crude degassing stages as opposed to two in cluster one by giving a, a, a good OPEX saving um, associated with reduced power requirements for gas compression. Cluster two, again, with its higher temperatures, may not, um, but will have a lot less heating requirements, um, so it may not need its in the inlet heater that has been designed, and it may need a much smaller interstage heater if, if required at all. And also cluster two may require higher flow line design pressures than cluster one, which would increase the capex. And again, cluster two has a requirement for gas lift, which may uh, require a different gas compression system and pressure profile compared with the first cluster. So because of these differences in the requirements, the optimal solution for cluster one is not the optimal solution for cluster two. But NOV as the top size designer must ensure the design is flexible to accommodate all design scenarios. So the objective is therefore to find a common cost effective solution to satisfy multiple clusters. So having reviewed the cluster design premises using the TM650, which is our most mature um, design, as the starting point, um, we see that based on the production profiles, the TM650 with its higher processing capacity of around 60,000 barrels of oil is more suited to larger fields or clusters uh, with higher production rates. And also the, the low gas flow rates on cluster one are likely to be too low for use in our selected gas turbines, hence that, that wouldn't be a, a viable power generation solution. So our proposed uh, solution, which could be developed, would be based on, on the information provided, would be to select the smaller TM450 FPSO with an oil processing capacity of 30,000 barrels a day. By using the TM450, it may be possible to optimize the production profiles of the clusters to more closely match that of the production of the TM450. 
So although the wide range of 26,000 barrels a day to sort of 45,000 barrels a day was provided for the um, for cluster the th with the 45,000 barrel a day for cluster one, that was actually based on that, on the high case production case, whereas the mid case is actually um, only around 34,000 barrels a day. So potentially by maintaining a, a slightly lower peak production rate over a longer period of time uh, may provide a more economical solution. So the top sides gas turbines um, which are used for power generation on the TM650 can be replaced um, with dual fuel or tri-fuel engines which can be located in the shifts the ship's machinery space, which would then also free up more space on the top sides for processing equipment. And I think it's just worth to, to point out that one of the, the common sort of challenges between um, either using the 650 or the 450 um, would be that the HPHT well, which is a, a pressure of around about 70, 750 bar, would need to, um, to have some sort of safeguarding of the top sides, which only has a design limit of 345 bar G. So we'd probably have to in either install um, some sort of, I guess, costly and expensive subsea over pressure protection system, um, or potentially look at actually removing that field from the cluster it's, itself as an option. So, just to demonstrate the, the flexible nature and advantage of the modular approach when moving to the lower top sides capacity, a number of modules can actually be removed from the TM450 to achieve the TM450 solution. So, as shown on, on here where the gaps, well, shown on here where, the, where we have the gaps in our, our process, uh, our top sides modules, we've removed the power generation system from this area and um, reduce the number of uh, crude separation modules um, from two to one and then remove that gas compression uh, module from here also. And so here you can see um, the TM potential TM450 design for use in by the clusters. And the TM450 uses the same uh, overall layout approach uh, where we have the four main areas um, with the living quarters at the front, the utility uh, area, um, the processing metering area and the offloading area as well. And so as mentioned here in our um, processing area, we have this, the, uh, the single crude separation produced water treatment module, the single gas compression um, module here and the power generation which was located here would now be in the, uh, the ship's aft machinery space. And we've also um, still remain, have the, the flexible um, module space to either um, increase for either field specific or client specific requirements um, if we needed to expand any of the module sizes. And likewise in the utility module um, as well. And we also have some um, spare capacity on the, the poop deck as well for additional equipment if required. So I think this quite well demonstrates the honeybee concept of having a, a transferable and scalable design using a flexible modular approach. So last slide in terms of the actually the solution development. To further develop this TM450 um, solution to, to get it to the level, the basic design level which our TM450 is, um, it is necessary to maximise the, the key data available for the clusters and to ensure that that data is quality data. And by having that quality data, that would help us maximise the operating envelope of the FPSO, which will maximise the number of fields which can be produced by the FPSO. And crucially, uh, develop a low capex solution for the first cluster, where in today's environment, raising the capex is a very big challenge. And the data then will also allow us to make better informed decisions to avoid costly design upgrades when moving between fields. So thus reducing the capex for the next, the next customer. And the ultimate solution or the ultimate goal is to develop a safe, reliable, flexible and cost effective Honeybee FPSO to meet the needs of the industry. And through information sharing and working more closely together, this can be achieved. Thank you all for your time.